for all three days. That's amazing. And how many of you guys, this is your first day here at Galaxy Con? A ton of you. Thank you very much for spending your afternoon with us. We have a very fun Q&A panel scheduled here. Uh, and as I said, it is a Q&A, so we do have a live microphone right there. But before anybody lines up for that, I just have a couple rules to go over. First, let's be courteous to our other GalaxyCon fans. Now let's try to keep our two, three, four, five part questions <laughs> to a minimum. Uh, second, no request. Uh, can't uh, ask for a selfie at the front of the stage. You can't ask Mr. Welker for a $10 loan. Uh, you can't leave a voicemail for your mom, no matter how badly she wants to be here. But rule number three, and this is the most important, please have fun. So are you guys ready to practice rule number three? So with no further ado, please help me welcome our guest of honor at this time. You know him as the voice of Optimus Prime. Help me welcome Peter Cullen. And he is the voice of Megatron. Give it up for Oscar Award winning Frank Welker. My friend Oscar gave me a little thing. It's no big deal, really. Thanks for mentioning that. Hello! see it sometime in this hotel. <laughs> Beautiful, Thanks. the old buildings, yeah. bricks and stuff, and we're, yeah, we're suckers for that. We, we love the, I especially love the name of a lot of the businesses on these older buildings. Oh. Like, like Stumpy's um, Wine and yeah. something. <laughs> <laughs> Big Herbs. Big Herbs is good. <laughs> Little Herbs, I like that one. <laughs> At, at what age did you start doing voices and realize that, hey, I'm pretty good at this, and not just, you know, something, oh, okay, they'll do this for fun. But when did you realize, that I'm pretty good at doing voices? Well, my mother told me that when I was born, I came out and impersonated the doctor. <laughs> To answer that, uh, I, I, I've had a penchant for doing sounds and uh, eventually turned into doing people. And when I was a kid, it was great. I used to get in trouble all the time because I would impersonate uh, anything that I heard that was different. And I would do it out loud in the class and I would always be sent to detention and getting this 
the ruler. Uh, and eventually I just started doing it because it attracted a lot of attention. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. Class clown on that one, right? Yeah. yeah. Same thing for me exactly as Peter. And uh, I remember starting out with, I think, probably animal sounds first and then doing people and friends, telephones of friends, parents, you know, the whole shot, and then spending time in the <coughs> principal's office. <laughs> you know, when you're doing something you love, uh, you never work a day in your life. Right. Absolutely. So, I've been unemployed for, <laughs> <laughs> for years and years. So what would you recommend to uh, somebody who maybe is a little mischievous in class and is, uh, you know, making noises, doing impersonations of, of their teacher or principal or, you know, of friends? What would you, what recommendation would you uh, give to guide them down a path that could actually lead to a career as opposed to just mischief? Well, and I've said this before because it, it affected me. And, uh, I would say the first thing you want to do if you're interested in voices or really anything in life is, is read. Read everything you can get your hands on. And then if you're interested in voices, read a lot of it, you know. And then if you're actually doing noises, you want to do that, you actually want to make it a career, um, let your imagination go. And usually it starts with... Uh, doing impersonations, which is fine, that gets you started. But then you wanna start working on your own characters, creating your own sounds, your own characters. But um, just, you know, let your imagination go, you can, you can do it. Yeah, I, I agree, and, and uh, except for one thing, I think when you're in school and you're, you know, at home you can get away with it. At school, you, you can only take it as far as, it, you get to be disciplined. <laughs> just, just, you have to know just where to stop. <laughs> if you do end up in the principal's office, you know you're on your way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I so uh, I think we're here to talk about a little show called Transformers. Is anybody familiar? <laughs> So when you were auditioning, or even when you when you got the role uh, for this uh, Robots in the Skies cartoon, did you think that you would be here in 2020 talking about that show, that TV show from 1984? No. <laughs> no, not even a little bit. No. Uh, I don't know what the answer would that that would be. Um, we, Frank and I. I can't speak for him because he's done 10 times as many animated series as I have. That's not true. He oh, can yeah. speak for me and sound exactly like me. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, you can take the rest of the day off. <laughs> That's when you're not looking. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> Did you think I love doing that to Peter, by the way. <laughs> Did, did you think that in 1984, when you got the role for Transformers, that it would be such a big deal? Or when did you realize, when did you realize that it was a big deal? Yeah, okay, I, uh, we did so many auditions, and we did so many shows, and some of them would last, and some of them wouldn't. You know, one show, we, I met Frank, my first show that I met him on was, Mighty Man and Yuck. <laughs> Mighty Man was a little miniature superhero, and Yuck was the ugliest dog in the world. <laughs> so ugly that he had to wear a dog house over his head. Never saw him, just the dog house. Just the dog. And the Mighty Man, who sounded like Bing Crosby. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. <laughs> and uh, he would tell Yuck not to take the doghouse off because he's so ugly that it would cause mayhem, chaos, literally just 
destruction. And I say, no, 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 yet, no, 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 get an audition like Transformers and uh, it's a funny thing. Well, I got an audition for a truck today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you don't think it's going to go anywhere because you're so used to that. So, but then, like, yeah, like Peter was saying, you know, at the time, this was like the renaissance for animation for all of us. I mean, it really, there were, and we, there was just a handful of doing voices. So we were really, really busy, you know, and you'd run into a show and go and go and be done. And Transformers was interesting. I remember going, in, shh, what? My daddy's talking. <laughs> <laughs> but we just had this table full of all these different Transformers, and it was just fun just looking at them. But I never really thought that this would be like a, you know, the wonderful legacy show that it is during the end of it. Do you guys like to take some questions from the audience? Certainly. As long as you're not too difficult. <laughs> Hello. Excuse me, gentlemen. I am the most trusted puppet in media. Reporting since Roswell, Sam Newsman. And before the Transformers questions come rolling in, just want to ask you, Mr. Welker, if you could just do that voice that my wife does every time she starts talking. I mean, Dr. Claw. I would be more than happy to. And. Uh... <clears throat> Resemblance to another voice you might recognize. Yeah. Soundwave. Soundwave. I am Soundwave. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hi. So, lifelong fan of Transformers. Um, thank you for being a part of my childhood. Now, my question is: um, Over the years, Optimus and Megatron have gone through many different versions, and Although their voices have stayed about the same for the most part, their personalities have changed quite a bit. I was wondering if one particular version, and this goes to each of you, of your characters was your favorite to voice. Well, definitely Optimus Prime for me. And uh, going back to the Generation 1, back in the 1984 and 85, before the movie, uh, it was a different time. It was a... It, there were fun times for me, those couple of years before I died, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I forgot that, have you? <laughs> <laughs> and working with all the guys, Frank and I worked with a whole bunch of guys. We'd all be in the same studio, standing behind mics facing a glass, you know, window, looking into the control room where we'd be directed. And uh, <clears throat> they were fun times. They were really memorably fun times. And uh, is that memorable? Yeah. Look that up, Mr. Paul. Okay, memorable. And they were memorable times. And uh, we had uh, we had so much fun. So there would be times when we'd be uh, doing a script, and a line would come out, and it would be like a line that. John Wayne would have said in a in a movie like that we had just seen and, or something, and then of course I'd go on and do a John Wayne as Optimus Prime, <laughs> and then he'd throw in a Gabby Hayes or Walter Benny. Or Walter. So we we go through a few of those and. You create a little excitement in the studio. And, but sometimes these guys didn't even pick up on that. You know, the director would have <laughs> yeah, well, But then it was there, and somebody said to me once, you did John Wayne, that's, that's, 
the optimist prime is John Wayne, isn't he? I said, no, but you must have heard that show, you know. <laughs> but every now and then, you would throw in a character like that. I think for um, for me, obviously, like Peter, I think loved Optimus Prime. I loved uh, Megatron, and uh, Megatron has gone through quite a bit of change. Where Optimus has always been that beautiful voice, which is Peter. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but I mean, it, it's true. I mean, Optimus Prime, come on, it's such a great voice. But Megatron uh, started out in uh, G1. Sort of, uh, I am Megatron, leader of the Decepticons, and I had sort of a multi kind of scratchy voice. Then we sort of started transforming into Prime, our Prime version. He was a little bit more human sounding. And last, a little bit of this. Then we went into the features of he was Galvatron. Then from Galvatron, he turned back into Megatron, leader of the Decepticons! But I enjoyed a lot, to be honest with you. Thank you. Hello. Now, I want to be a voice actor. I want to be, like, a very good. So what's the best advice becoming a voice actor? Gosh. Well, I'm, I'm, it's a great life. <laughs> and like I said earlier, if you do something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. You know, it's just one. That's not always true. But nonetheless, uh, encourage yourself by keeping at it. All right. And uh, never give up. I'll keep trying. Yeah. <laughs> Make more different voices, you know, listen to yourself. I know you did the voice up, kill your source of it's monkey noises. Uh-huh. Do it. <laughs> uh, you should remind me of my director. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Curious George. But sometimes there's other things that come in, come into play. I mean, obviously, there are businesses and companies and decisions are made that uh, are for certain reasons. But I think both Peter and I love what we do, and we'd love to go back in and do those voices. And of course, I, I you uh, enjoyed the baby carpet. That was a lot of fun. But sometimes when there's a whole new group of people, they want to be with people that they know. So, I guess I need to go out on my own lily pad. Oh, gee whiz. <laughs> you just make everything sound so nice. Uh, I like you. I like you too. <laughs> Thank you very much for that question. We appreciate it, don't we? Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> you're, you're welcome, Ben, for coming to New York. You're welcome. Great, buddy. Thank you very Hello. much. Hi. A little short for the mic, sorry. Um, you both have such a wide range of characters and properties you've been associated with. And the comic books are starting to explore crossing over some of these properties with Transformers. 
What other property that you have worked on would you like to see cross paths with Transformers? Oh, well, we did one. Um, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, Scooby Doo was Supernatural. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yes! It was so much fun. And uh, those guys, I guess they had an absolute blast because we didn't work together. But we read the scripts together and then we worked, you know, read the scripts and then worked individually. But the product, oh, it was so much fun. And their guys that came in from their show, not the stars themselves, but the people that were associated with the show. Uh, they just had a blast, and so did we. I, I think that's a, that's a great question, by the way, and I hope we do more, and I hope the Transformers, we could do that. Go yeah. on some other shows, you know? yeah. As long as Netflix doesn't do it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite line? Yeah, there are a lot of them. <laughs> well, I loved uh, Hold On to Your Dreams. The future is built on dreams. I love that one. Um, I love the Till All or One. <laughs> and I also like One Shall Stand. One shall fall. What? <laughs> I kind of like power through tyranny. Transformers uh, truck, the generation one, the Kenwood, that the truck and trailer, I have that, and uh, I had the Ironhide wa uh, wagon thing that I used to stick inside the truck. <laughs> uh, and then I kept it uh, in my den, and one day, years later, I went to look for it, and I couldn't find it. And then I started finding pieces of it um, that maybe somebody took it apart and didn't know how to put it back together again. And I think it was uh, somebody who was staying in my house while I was away. <laughs> and uh, they didn't understand Transformers. They didn't know what it was all about. But I found them all eventually, and uh, I couldn't put it back together myself. <laughs> But I still have those two, and uh, in pieces. <laughs> still, since 1984. Well, I have the, uh, let me rephrase that. I had the P-38, which was, uh, again, a little difficult for me to operate. So I had a little friend from next door, about maybe three or four. <laughs> Rubik Cube guys, I hate them. <laughs> do it again, do it again. <laughs> and he eventually ended up with that. And I, I wish I had it today, but right now I've just had a lot of the, uh, some newer things that I've received, but uh, I would sure wish I had that P38. That, that reminds me of me and my friend. He, he's, he has a different one, so it's like, I don't know how to work this. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, my question is for Mr. Walker. How would you go about taking down an uh, inept leader? <laughs> I'm trying to digest the question. <laughs> I would think of my friend, Sky 
say full good, but I'm good at it. <laughs> I'm trying to think of some words that I would use to take about what to say. I am the leader. You obey me, or you will be destroyed, and you will have to join the Autobots. <laughs> Well, you've obviously studied that very well. Uh, I think I was probably speaking for Peter, but I'll let him speak for himself. But, you know, we've done so many shows, um, it's hard to remember the exact uh, situations like that you're staying in. But I'll tell you, working with Peter in any situation, it, it's really fun when we play opposites. When he's a hero and I'm the bad guy. I mean, it's just fun. But when we play heroes together, uh, like G.I. Joe on some of those shows, remember? And various characters, it's also a great thrill. But I, I do like doing combat with him because in real life, he's just the best guy in the world. <laughs> Thank you. Really good on that, by the way. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, no don't be sorry. You're kidding. That was wonderful. I wish we uh, were a little bit more adept at some of those. Uh, but no, no, don't, don't be sorry. That's terrific. You know, there is an encyclopedia for uh, Transformers. It's about this thick. <laughs> at Hasbro, there's a design uh, section at Hasbro where they design the toys. And... Um, they create them, create the characters. And there's one guy in particular, he knows everything there is to know about the Transformer. And like I said, this book is that thick. So I, I've been back to Hasbro a couple of times and I've been in that area and I've looked at that book and I was amazed how little I knew <laughs> I mean it. I mean, the history, of the Cybertron part, the, you know, the primes, the, there's so much more to it than, there's more to it than meets the eye. <laughs> well, we really appreciate people like you that really understand the shows and yeah. know the episodes and know the people. I mean, it's very impressive. Yeah, so if I had to write an exam, really I'd flunk. <laughs> So thank you. Yeah, thank you, dear. Mr. Welker, is it true you used to hang out with Elvis? <laughs> yep. <laughs> I will tell you a quick story. Uh, yeah, we did a, a film together, and for I think it was six weeks, we worked without seeing Elvis. And uh, he was finishing up a film, I think, or uh, either concert or No, I think he's finishing up another film in Hawaii, but anyhow. So he came to MGM to do this, and we were already running around, and we said, okay, Elvis is coming today. Your scene is gonna be with Elvis today. And I thought, oh, well, we'll rehearse, and everything's gonna be great. He said, no, no, the stand-in will be here, Elvis will be here at four o'clock, just before we break to go home. So there was four of us uh, that were running around, and we were gonna, carrying suitcases up the stage. A little tiny thing like this, that, you know, in Hollywood, the staircases go up to nowhere, and there's just a little, you know, it looks like a beautiful home, but you open it up and there's nothing there, but a little thing that you stand on and you fall off. So we rehearse and take our suitcase and go up and stand a little thing like this, and then Elvis came. No rehearsal, nothing. I have not met him. We're like this, and Elvis went, eh, bell rings, eh. Running up the stairs, and I'm the last one, so I'm standing right at the door. Elvis was saying, "Oh, I'm going to see you on the front of the room. I'm going to take secrets. It's going to be cool. I'm saying it's going to be." And all of a sudden, the door opens. Boom! And I'm like this, and Elvis is right there. 
I mean, literally, my nose is in his chest. <laughs> I look up. Oh. What's happening down there, man? <laughs> he looked great. It was nice. It was fun. Thank you for the question. Thanks much. It's called You're Just Rad. Huh? You're Just Rad. Oh. <laughs> rad. I try to make my story a little shorter, but I appreciate that. Hi, gentlemen. I'm Chad. Uh, you guys have been in business for a while, and I was wondering if you could compare what it was like to work for the industry back in the mid-80s versus, you know, in the past five, ten years. Like, what, how things changed? Well, they've changed a lot. Uh, like, uh, for example, in our recording sessions, we would all be in the same studio and uh, working, you know, with each other reading our scripts and a lot of those come today people uh, they don't all record at the same time um, when I did the movie with Michael Bay uh, I would work alone with no other people at all except the one um, McDormand uh, she wanted to know what I sounded like and how I said my lines to her and, uh, as it turned out, she had to act to a boom that was way up there. She had to talk to that, and I'd be standing beside her. <laughs> but she couldn't look at me. She had to look up at Optimus Prime, who was a crane. <laughs> and uh, she'd be up there, and I'd be reading my lines to her. So it, it's, everything is, it, it's different. It's different than it was back in the early 80s. And, uh, uh, well, you do a lot more than I do. Yeah. So, but, but what you're saying, too, is that uh, the technology now is just, it's yes. so different. You know, uh, we used to do the flat animation, and now, you know, there's all the three, the uh, computer-generated an animation. But uh, as Peter was saying, we used to do the ensemble cast, and that was really a lot of fun because it's like a family. You meet everybody, and you have a great time. And now you pretty much go in and record by yourself. Even the series we do by ourselves. Most of the time, yeah. Thank you very so, much. Yeah, and I, but I think probably fun-wise, we had more fun when we did ensemble group together. Speed-wise, and maybe technical stuff, if you're doing monsters or whatever, it's easy to concentrate by yourself. So it has a little bit of a double-edged sword. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Well. Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, you guys are excellent. Your voices are so iconic. Thank you. How do you guys feel about uh, other actors taking on that role and trying to sound like you guys? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? Um, it's kind of a, an unwritten law in the business that we come from and where when we grew up in the business is you just don't do that. You know, we never take over anybody's voice. You can't do it themselves. Right. You just don't do it. But yeah, it's grand theft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's happening now with Netflix. They're uh, going to produce a, a Transformer series, but they're not going union. And, you know, we were in our union. You know, that's what protects us all as actors, you know. When other guys, you know, go underneath that, and uh, they uh, literally are, you know, they're, they're destroying a union from within, you know, from outside. It's subterfuge, it's just, uh, it's wrong, it's wrong. But that's what's gonna happen with this series. It'll be somebody else going off in the prime, and that hurts, that hurts. <laughs> Yeah, don't let it happen. <laughs> Get on Netflix. They're, they're bad. That's not nice. To me. <laughs> but ultimately, we do everything for you. So you're you're the the audience. You're the power. So what you want will ultimately be the end. So you know you decide what you want, and hopefully it's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Uh, the Bumblebee movie. Mm -hmm. 
they was uh, they hired another person to do me for uh, during the production, and then they were going to bring me in for one day because they didn't want to pay me, you know, for any more than they had to. So, so this guy worked for three or four months, and when I came in, they had actually recorded this guy, and I had to impersonate a him, impersonating me, and his timing was wrong. His inflections were wrong. He didn't know how to drag a vowel, or he didn't know how to make prime sincere. So he'd skip over the things that did, and it just—I went, ah, this is horrible. But I had to, I had to mimic him because they had already animated to his sound, and uh, that's why he doesn't come across all that great in the. Uh, in the movie. The long shots I'm okay on, but the close-up stuff, if you watch that movie, you'll see I was sickened by it. It hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to be the bad guy here and just let everyone know that we only have about five more minutes or so here with uh, with our Transformer friends. Um, mine, is, mine is decently quick. All right. Um, hi, my name is Karen, and my question is for either one of you to answer. Um, actors on the resumes put down uh, special skills, and I'm just curious, what is the weirdest special skill you've listed on your resume, and did you actually do that weird special skill at the time you listed it on your resume? Good question. <laughs> well, he flies airplanes, and I rope steer. Say all hell, Mary Sean. <laughs> Welcome to <the> September. <laughs> in the G1 series, a really entertaining thing for me was the relationship between you and Starscream. So, what I wanted to ask was, how was it working with Chris Lada? I know he's not longer with us anymore. He was also co commander in G.I. Joe. But how was that really, How was it working with him? Well, uh, Peter will, will tell you also. I mean, Chris was. Uh, <laughs> He was a unique individual, and, and uh, he put so much power, strength, energy into his character that we would look at him, and the rest of the cast is kind of cool, calm, just sitting here, and, Chris, <laughs> and he would be sweating just rivers, you know. I mean, he must have had to drink at least five gallons of water just to stand up. But he put so much energy into his character and his face, and I mean, he was he was just I'd have to say a trip. That's you know that comes to mind that he was a trip. He intensity. Was, intensity. Intensity. Yeah. But he was a lot of fun. He was we're missing. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. You know, uh, I think probably uh, we're we were probably at the end, uh, so we were thinking that maybe uh, you guys would like to see us uh, actually read something from yeah. Yeah. Megatron. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You guys, guys want to see this? Yeah. So, because we're going to read that, I have to prepare it. Oh, getting out your glasses. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Such a fun. <laughs> so, here we stand, leaders of the Autobots Decepticons. We alone control the future of this planet Earth and the universe beyond. We can share the power of destiny and all of the destiny that lies before us. Megatron, it is not power I seek. I wish only to protect this planet, and I want no harm to come to these humans. You fool! Why throw away your life so recklessly? With energon from the Earth and our troops, we can rebuild Cybertron and control the galaxy 
The entire universe awaits us. I will not endanger the Earth or its humans. Cybertron has shown us that devastation comes from greed and power. And you will be forever my enemy, Optimus Prime! No one will stand in my way! Then, one shall stand and one shall fall. So be it! Power through tyranny! I will never give up hope that one day we will all stand as one. Until then, Autobots, roll out!